G'day, this is Andy from Melody. In today's vlog, we're going to talk to a friend of mine, the marvellous Creve Stenders. Creve is a cinema and TV director with an extraordinary list of credits, including iconic movies such as Red Dog and Danger Close, The Battle of Long Tan, multiple industry awards and accolades, an impressive list of TV drama and comedy, and also some amazing documentaries about crucial cultural touchstones. I'm very grateful that we managed to corner him in the production office today before he hits out on another awesome project. Creve Standers, thanks so much for your time. Considering the amount of projects that you've been directing over the last few years and the, and the breadth of projects, uh, you've clearly been insanely busy. So uh, we really appreciate it here at Melody. Um, viewers, just for the record, Creve and I have had some pretty boisterous, maybe drunken dancing sessions over the years. And... Uh, <laughs> I get the sense from those super fun nights that music really touches you. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, totally, totally. I mean, if I wasn't a filmmaker, I'd be a musician, I think, even though I can't play an instrument. <laughs> you, did you learn anything? Is your family music? I did. I, le I, did, I learned the piano for a while when I was a kid and uh, a, a Latvian folk instrument called a corkle, which is kind of like a zither. Um, and it was a really hard instrument to learn and especially impossible to tune. Um, and I don't know, I just dropped, dropped the ball far too early on both. So uh, unfortunately, it's one of, my, one of my big regrets. But um, my son is now playing music and I'm really proud of him that he's stuck with playing trumpet and uh, he's kind of keeping music alive inside the house, which is great. It's great to have music around in the house. There's no doubt about it. And in our house, there's a, as you can see behind me, there's a guitar every, a guitar every five paces, which is, and if they're out, they get played, which is the best part. Um, so tell me, what what is it about music um, that touches you? Well, um, I mean, to me, it's food. You know, it's spiritual food. It's like a. Uh, I need to listen to music as much as I need to kind of eat protein or, or, or have vegetables. You know, it's, 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 it's sustains me. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's a very powerful, uh, art form, um, that I think reaches deep inside your soul. And as I said, it keeps you mentally healthy. I feel it's a, it's a great tonic, a great anodyne, um, a great painkiller. Um, and then it's a beautiful, um, I just find music very uh, inspiring. You know, it, it takes me places. It, I can time travel with it. I can physically, my mind can go wherever it wants to go with the song or with a piece of music. It's a very powerful, evocative element. So, you know, um, to me, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a fundamental part of enjoying life. Great to hear. We we hear describe it as the feels, um, both to ourselves, um, you know, as a, as a way of you know, kind of internally in the company talking about it, and the it's and it's it's um purpose, but also to clients too. And I'm, I'm firmly of the belief that what you hear in things is both the information and the emotion. Um, would you would you think does that resonate with you? Totally. I think music does that thing that uh, no other art form can, is that, it, as you said, you feel it as well as hear it. Um, and it just it just enters a part of your psyche, a part of your soul, a part of your being that no other form does. You know, it's sort of, it's fundamental. It's kind of the closest thing I think there is to sort of a pure voice or a pure, you just talk about the feels and I talk about almost, you know, even though I don't do transcendental meditation, but they talk about this idea of the field, that there is out there, there is this field that you can become, uh, you can have a communion with. And I feel music is is a byproduct of this field that's out there, that there just is this collective um, huge universe of, of ideas, of energy, and music is the, the echo of that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to put it. Um it is kind of magical. I've had that conversation with plenty of people about it as, as the, the craft form is sort of the most magical. It kind of does stuff without you knowing that it's doing things, something to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I um, am a big believer in the value of quiet time, conversely. 
um, because sometimes you don't know what you're hearing until it's not there. Um, and I think this is especially true in music composition, w whatever the music is that you're making, whether it's a, a rock track and you just pull the bass line out for four bars and bring it back in, it has a huge impact. Um, and one of my favorite, uh, well, you know, obviously sound for picture and music composition for picture, I think it's really relevant too. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this um, is a moment uh, quite early in your movie, um, The uh, Danger Close, which was kicking ass on Netflix last week. Congratulations. Um, and I remember it in the cinema, watching it in the cinema. Uh, there's a moment relatively early on when the first platoon goes out um, and things get uh, really quiet. Everything's pulled back. The music's pulled back. Then there's just some very gentle sound effects. And in the context of the scene, it's, it's almost quite serene. And then all hell breaks loose, um, which had a huge impact. You know, it's the setup before the 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 impact. Um, do you use this tool? Have you used this tool in other projects? Yeah, I mean, it's a really. I mean, I think now that we're talking about film or picture music, that that fusion, that 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 play, is where um, I really uh, kind of get my rocks off. <laughs> To me, there's nothing better than, than, than music or sound because um, I put music under the category of sound um, and image. And that fusion to me creates this tertiary, this third sort of incredible magic. Um, and that's where my, that's where I like to think, you know, my musicality comes into, comes into play. That's where I kind of feel, um, I sort of bridge the gap between being a filmmaker and being a musician. Um, and yeah, one of the things I think is the, you know, one of the things I've, I've kind of um, always tried to learn and teach myself when I've scored films is um, when to score and when not to score. And I find it really hard. I find it really hard to work that out um, and work out the balance because it really, it, it always depends on what angle you come into reading a film. You know, you come to it at a, at a high angle, you know, and, 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 and you want music everywhere or you come in really low and you want it really really um, use sparingly and it's very difficult to work out and every time you watch a film especially when you're editing it you're either coming in really high or really low so it's very hard I find someone to get that objective like what angle am I going to come out from the score um, but usually what you do is you follow your instincts and um, I think all of us to a certain degree especially musicians especially those of us who kind of you know when you start cutting stuff and you start sort of getting a few flying hours up in terms of watching films and, and editing them, you start building up an instinctual rhythm about when when to hold back and when to when to when to drive. And that's sort of an inner clock, I think, that you develop. Um, and in the case of that scene you wrote in Danger Close, well the, the prime thing that was driving that was when we read the books and heard all the accounts of that first um, uh, volley of fire they said it was that exact thing happened they said they were walking into this uh, plantation and things suddenly got eerily quiet like they all were aware of how quiet it it was and that's when the the hail of bullets started so we sort of that was a direct inspiration from the accounts of the of the day but yeah you know it's it's um you know, Caitlin, who, Caitlin Yeo, who did the score for that film, you know, did a remarkable job in uh, working with me to contour the film and to, you know, she would say, no, I don't think you need score here. You don't. You know, so she would, I'd, I'd take her lead as well as to when we did this. I think we really need, you know, a cue here to take us into there. And so it was a constant conversation about, you know, where to go. And sometimes it was obvious where, where the score was, needed to work and that was you know we've sort of reverse engineered sometimes from moments like the one you just just described so yeah that, uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer but um yeah it's 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 one of the trickiest things i for example i did a film years ago that i can't almost watch anymore now called kill me three times and it was sort of um it's just i can't watch it because it's just overscored it's just so much score in it it just it makes me nauseous <laughs> So I watch that now and I kind of go, this is what you don't do. But now my hand was kind of like, I had my hand, my arm behind my back because 
I came up with a, a score for that film that I loved. It was a very kind of lots of saxophone. It was really 80s, really kind of blue, um, sorry, Benny Blue, very um, of an era. And the producers hated it and they wanted what they called a comedy score um, because they wanted to make the film into a comedy, even though it was already was a comedy. They wanted to push the comedy and there were American producers. And it's the first time I worked with American producers and, oh, my God, they scored everything. Everything was had a cue to it because they felt that would drive the comedy and make people aware that it was a comedy. Um, and that's a classic point where I'll never want to go back to that, um, being forced to do that ever again in my, in my career, in my life. Um, so there's two extremes there for you. <laughs> Well, well, at least you've got some uh, some some compass points now to reference everything that you do in the future. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I just, you know, watch um, Kill Me Three Times. No, 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 I know, I know. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. And that, that, that your discussion about Caitlin, who, uh, if you haven't heard of her uh, out there, um, Caitlin Yeo is an extraordinary composer. Um, and your relationship with her during um, the process and, and discussing when and when not to score do you, I mean, in my own experience writing uh, with producers and directors, you know, the successful relations, so the success, successful outcomes generally hinge on the, the, the quality of the communication between both sides of that equation, either, you know, between the, the composer and the person who's you know, um, asking them to compose, which could be a number of different people. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or strategies that you use to help you get across what it is that you that you're hearing or, or what you feel is right um and do they work what you know do they work universally i had something that uh, you work uh, work with um caitlin and work with other people yeah well what i try to do is um you know when i talk start talking to a composer about a project um I tend to always have a very, I think you kind of just the same as a, your job as a director is to, you know, without sounding high and mighty, your job is to have a vision. You know, that's your, that's what you're there for is to direct this thing, direct it in a direction, you know, and um, music as I've hopefully made very clear to me is, 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 is absolutely critical part of that because I consider even as a director, what I do when I work with actors or when I'm making anything, it's all music. It's all visual music, you know. I, I use this a lot, this analogy a lot in my acting workshops where I, I say to the actors, you are instruments. Each one of you is a unique instrument that is playing the music of this script. So um, to me, it's all music. And therefore, the actual music in the film is really important. So the same way I have to have a vision about the tone of the film, um, the vision of the way it's going to look and the way it's going to be cast, I also feel I need to take responsibility and have at least an idea of what the music needs to be because there's a thousand choices, thousands of choices of what you can do with a film musically. Um, and I always love landing on a kind of an idea or a concept that um, that is sort of the, um, I guess, the philosophy, the musical philosophy of the film or the story that we're going to tell. And this is what I'm, this is what I think it should be. Um, and I throw that over to the composer and see what they respond with. So, you know, um, it's either based on a kind of concept of I just want it to be one instrument or, you know, I want it to be all electronic or I want it to be all kind of sound um, acoustic instruments or, and usually it's, usually it's, it's referring to a lot of time it's, it's, it's using references of other films or, or of other scores and things that I think, you know, an element of that mixed with this, that's the idea. You know what I mean? So for um, for Danger Close, you know, the thing was the, the main, the main, you know, the main inspiration or the main concept or idea of that was to have um, uh, a feminine element to the music because the whole film was about these men killing each other and it was such a masculine um uh world that we were in and very violent i wanted a counterpoint to that and i really felt like um having the ghostly feminine presence in the music would be a really great juxtaposition a really great contrast 
and obviously, you know, Caitlin's a female, so that was partly the other idea there was that, you know, to get to get um, a female composer on, not just tokenistically, but actually, you know, for for a very specific creative um, and spiritual purpose. And that was the first kind of brief. And we both spoke about vocal vocalizations, you know, and the idea of you know being able to use vocals in an abstract way, and obviously um, the score for Arrival, you know, the the um, Johansson score for Arrival was was one of our touchstones. So we knew we wanted sort of that that kind of uh, very bold use of, of of voices, like a Leggetti, you know, two thousand and one, that whole sort of choral aspect to it. And then one night I was watching a film, you know, I tend to watch a lot of movies and I watched a film, I can't remember, The Man with the Iron Heart, with Jason Clarke, a film made about five years ago about a Nazi uh, who was assassinated and who survived the assassination. And uh, I can't remember the actual story, but it started with this amazing title track, this amazing huge organ, and suddenly the organ sound just went, wow, that sound. Is extraordinary. It's so powerful and so old and so sort of it just conjured up all these great um, emotions and that. So there were the two colours that I said, look, um, have a listen to this, this organ track and and listen to this choir and listen to this choral aspect. And that's and then Caitlin came in with a whole rhythmic thing of using um, you know um, Eastern you know, percussive elements and, you know, obviously bringing in the, the sort of the, the Eastern quality to it, but not in a tokenistic way, but in a really great way that informed the, that could inform the action and the drive of the film. So, you know, you just sort of start with a few colours and then you go, well, you know, that's kind of it. Go for it. <laughs> you know, so it's a very, you know, it's a really beautiful, fun process of, of of coming at it with a with an idea and then give, sharing that idea with the composer and then then coming back to you with an idea and, and but I always think that ultimately it's, you've always got to boil it down to something very simple because as we all know doing something simple is very very difficult um, but if you can if you can if you can nail the idea of the score in a simple concept or as I said painting in three or four colours then I think you've got you've got a score or or a philosophy or an approach to to, to to the um, to the to the subject or to the matter material at hand. You you say you watch a lot of movies, and I know you watch a lot of movies. Um, um, and you've, you use musical references from from uh, um, other cinema there for Danger Close, which leads me to asking: uh, Do you temp, and did you temp use temp score for? Uh, that and do you, as a rule, use temp, or would you prefer to wait until you get something from a composer? Um, I don't, personally, I don't like using temp because I think temp's really, you know, um, I use, do use temp, you know, when I have to, um, and it depends on what it is. But usually, what I've done, what I like to do, is engage the composer early and get them to start sketching ideas. And to me, that's always the best way to go: is just, just, just stems and beds of things just doodles, just ideas, and I use those when I'm in the editing room. So I'm already building out of the materials that the school will be built out of. And I find that's the best the best way to go. And then maybe there's one track or one element that I need to temp that's, again, using the same principles as the way I pitch my concept to the composer. I'm going, well, let's take this track, and I know, you know, you'll do something different with it, but there's the element that we... That, we like in this track is say the, the the rhythm of it or the or the key of it or the quality of it, you know, um, or the again the feel of it, you know. It's 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 got this great kind of major minor kind of shift in it, you know, um, or it's got this really fantastic repetitive quality that really works or whatever it is, you know. So I try and use when I do use tempo, I try and use it really surgically and really precisely. Um, and as I said, I love to embed it within the sketches that the composers already provided me, and kind of, and that way, no, there are no surprises. But even then, I did that, did that on Kill Me Three Times. So, you know, Johnny Klimek, who's an amazing, amazing composer, fucking incredible guy, like incredible, turns can turn um, on a dime. He wrote this beautiful score, and we were using it in the film. You know, we we're using it, and it was just so 
great, but you know that that's the problem. If other people don't like it, they'll that's the first thing they say. Lose that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But you know, I've learned my lesson there. Um, you know, which is work with people who you know um, respect your musical choices. Um, leave it at that. Yep. <laughs> although, although I am also, although that said, you know, scoring, you know, you can come into a project and score it incorrectly. You can. Sure. And, and you need sometimes to just go to get some earwax or, or ear floss, totally rub out that, that idea and come at it afresh. And that's also a challenge and can be also quite um, interesting and satisfying as well to sort of do a reset, like a complete desktop reset. And, okay, let's come at it this way. That's happened to me as well. That that um, that brings up an interesting point because one of the things I wanted to ask you is because you've done some projects um, in recent years, uh, documentary projects about you know particularly Australian things, um, most notably um, Slim Dusty's wife and um, uh, the Go Betweens, the the band the Go Betweens, and also um, Peter Brock, who was my one of my heroes when I was a kid growing up, which is you know which I loved and and you know. A, the fact that you know it starts the whole the, you're it's named after an angel song basically isn't it over the top yeah yeah well the first lyric, line out of a lyric yeah. out of it yeah this is it boys over the top over the top yeah which is fantastic but obviously you know you're using um uh production tracks in a in a production like that do you would you and did you um lay up like multiple tracks in a scene and then sort of a b them to see how it might affect or are you just kind of try and stick with a flavor and if it's not working come back to it and change it uh with production tracks you mean yeah um well it sort of really depends it's really the editor who who sort of almost acts as a kind of a, a co-composer because they're the ones making those choices sometimes um and yeah, it's a very, it really depends on the subject. You know, like for example, with Brock, um, we knew we could only afford one production track, which was The Long Line, the song we just mentioned by The Angels. Um, originally, it was going to be a lot of tracks, but you know, the budget didn't allow that. So we thought, okay, that's going to be our core track. And it's going to be for that particular Bathurst race, the one where he, you know, he did the record amount of laps or whatever it was in the, in the Tirana, you know the iconic race, that's going to be our centrepiece. Um, and we'll reverse engineer from there, you know, knowing that that's where we're going to go. And then Jason Fernandez, who did the soundtrack, who did the score for that film, did the thing exactly like I've said before. He gave me a whole bunch of um, ideas, like, you know, and I said, look, it's going to be electronic. I want it to be kind of, you know, really echo the 80s and 70s in terms of, you know, Jean-Michel Jarre and all those sort of um, Georgia Moroder, all that kind of sequence stuff. And that was our sort of a starting point, just as a bit of fun. And because I, I love that kind of music as well. And um, he just came up with a whole bunch of um, beds for us. And then we built it that way, you know, and the composer, uh, sorry, the editor then cut the stuff together. So she was sort of like, building the soundtrack in a really funny way, in a really crude way and building it towards knowing we're going to use the long line. And then, you know, the Universal came back and said, we'd love to have the long line open the open the film, but we couldn't afford it. So we got Jason to write a sort of a riff that was, that kind of was evocative of that, you know. So it was a kind of, yeah, it was very, it was sort of built up from a toolkit, you know. And then with the go-betweens, well, that was a completely different story in that, you know, the, we didn't have, we couldn't afford a composer on that. And um, so what I did instead, I thought, okay, well, I've got the next best thing. I've got Robert Forster, who um, I just said, well, look, I'm just getting in to play these songs acoustically. And um, I also, I, I mean, I filmed them playing them live, you know, singing to camera. Uh, and then I got him one day to just go into a studio with a musician, with another musician, and he put down a whole bunch of, instrumental acoustic versions of, of key songs. And then we use that as our score. So it was just a very pragmatic um, decision because it was just, you know, we just, it wasn't able to be scored or also the schedule didn't allow it. So we, that's what we did there. And, um, and then with, um, with Slim and I, I can't remember, we kind of, uh, I think we used some temp score mostly um, 
uh, you know, temp score, uh, or you know, yeah, I think it was temp score, and then we 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 basically had it over to Munro, and he came in and just totally made it come to life. You know, he just um, he used the temp score very very, uh, and, and, and because it was because it was temp, I wasn't that invested in it. I really went. It's got to be better, and I just went just just make this better. This is the you know what this is doing, and he would come up with something that was it was the, probably the most open brief I gave because it was country and western, it was country music, and there was a certain flavour already there. The the, the 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 framework was already there, and and um and he just did a beautiful job with that with, that, with uh, filling in the gaps once we'd locked off the film. Um. One of my favourite movies of all time, which may not be a surprise given my uh, uh, heritage is uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, is Once Were Warriors. Um, and it was directed by a guy called Lee Tamahori, who you would obviously know. And at the time when uh, uh, it was being made, he was the gun go-to TV commercial director in the country at the time. Um, and he was adapting a book by Alan Duff. Um, and along for the right, he brought up uh, a bunch of people who I, he, he was obviously working with in, in commercial land, um, most notably Murray McNabb and um, uh, Murray Grenlay as composers, who did an incredible score. Um, but um, obviously that transition from uh, short form to long form would probably have been a challenge. And in this instance, a challenge that worked, you know, extraordinarily well because, you know, Once Warriors is such a, an incredible film. An amazing film. Um, you cut your teeth on commercials way back when, didn't you? Did you find um, uh, that transition from trying to get it sorted in 30 seconds versus getting it sorted in 120 minutes um, challenging or, or not? Um, oh, gosh, I haven't thought about this for a long time. Uh, I found it, you know, what? I found 30 seconds more challenging ultimately, really. It was, it was a harder, I thought it was going to be a form that, because I kind of came out of film school and was doing music videos and hadn't made features yet, you know. Uh, that was always the, the goal was to end up making features, but I sort of did it kind of, not in a long-winded way, but just it was just a, it just took a long time to kind of get it, to break into that part of the industry. So commercials were a way in which I could kind of be gainfully employed and at least be kind of learning my craft. Um, but I found that 30 second medium really, a really hard one to conquer. Um, it's almost kind of impossible in a way because it's like you've got 30 seconds and then you have the client and then you have the agency and then you have a budget and you have an idea and um, it just gets so compromised so many times by so many factors that to make something great was really, you know, I, I thought it was easy because I saw so many great ads. I thought, well, relatively, how hard could it be? But I just found it after a while, it became so, such a grind to kind of push something through and to fight for something and to also learn about the language of that 30 second, whatever it is, even 60 seconds. Um, but that shorthand that you need to, uh, conquer is actually quite sophisticated. Um, and I think I naively thought it would be easier because it was shorter, but it wasn't. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, and I'm still, I made a, some ads that I was really um, quite happy with, but I never really felt, I think out of my whole career of ad making, I never really felt I nailed it. You know, it was always, it was always something that I felt like had eluded me, which is why I was happy to finally get into long form. Um, because that's really where I felt I was going anyway, where I needed to be. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot through um, making ads. And now I look back at it, it's interesting. I go, God, I knew so little <laughs> during that period. But I learned also learned a lot over that period. Um, but even if I knew what I know now from doing long form, and if I went back into doing short form, I think I'd be in a much better position. It's a really interesting point of view and I always and as, as a kind of an aside I always feel like no matter what you do in your creative pursuit it, it, like I've made a lot of music that isn't the kind of music that I necessarily like 
um, of made music because that's what's required for a situation. Um, um, and then I remember being a teenager and being kind of in my last year at high school, being forced to do the school musical and being forced to play in the Dixie band and sing in the barbershop quartet and the whatever. And all of it was not the music I wanted to make at all, but in every instance, it informed how I made the music I wanted to make without, without a doubt, like, uh, stuff that I played in the school musical, I then thought, you know what, if I turn the guitar up to 11 and, um, crank out that riff in a slightly different way, I've got a great rock song and, and I would never have gone down these paths regardless. So yeah, I'm a firm believer in, um, doesn't matter what you do, as long as you're, you know, style wise, as long as you're kind of making stuff, it will all inform, you will become better at your job and better at it. Um, at Melody, we're quite big on, and I am in general, um, um, quite big on um, mental health. And, and we're, we're very mindful of the fact that people who work for us, composers of, of which there are, uh, you know, upwards of a hundred now, spend a lot of time in rooms like this, sometimes without light. Um, uh, and this is true of many parts of our industry. Um, a lot of time by yourself um, or with one or two other people, um, wrangling the creative and the practical and the pragmatic, having arguments in your head <laughs> about what's working, what's not, um, or being left to your own devices and not really having um, a, a clue as to whether you're going down the right path or not. Anyway, it can be stressful, I guess, is, is the point. And we're always um, uh, mindful of the fact that, that uh, it's important to take time out. It's important to check on other people. It's important to um, uh, give yourself uh, leeway to um, uh, to find space if if things aren't going great. If you if things are becoming difficult, um, have you ever hit the wall at any point in your career, or found a, a time where you were finding things more or less difficult, and you needed to take some time to Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Last year, I had a, I had a pretty um, rough year, and um, you know, it was a, it was a kind of a combination of things. It's like a you know a long run of work that I never really sort of you know um, you know as we all know when the work's on you've got to take it. So you know um, you know it's because it's such a mercurial business. You just never know when you're not going to work. So every time there is work, you work. And I got to a point because of COVID, because of all the delays, I ended up, you know, being overloaded. I ended up having too much work and it really kind of uh, got to a point where I just had to go, look, I've got to, I'm not, I'm not coping. I'm not, it's the first time in my life where I literally, my brain stopped working. Um, my fingers turned into lead. I couldn't actually operate a keyboard. I was just like, I was just, just go to this, this sort of lead and fog. And, you know, I was getting anxiety attacks. So I was, you know, it was really horrible. And I realized my, it was my body just going, stop. You, you cannot, you just have to stop. And I did, I just stopped. And it was probably, you know, uh, at the time it was terrifying, but it was one of the best things that happened to me because I was able to kind of recalibrate and just, just, you know, re-sort out my priorities. Um, and literally clear my head and um and it was a great kind of cleansing or a great purging uh because you know there's so much doubt that accumulates and so much kind of as you said these arguments in your head and these sort of these ridiculous conversations that you can end up having that last for years you know about the one thing and about the one sort of um perception of yourself or perception of the situation um and it was great to kind of reach across point. It was actually, I'm really glad I did. Um, uh, and I think it's just important to um, know that you have a limit and know that ultimately it is just a job, you know, and it is just um, just a, a film or it's just a commercial or it's just a, just a documentary series. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not your family. You know what I mean? It's not, it's you, 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 you've got to really kind of sort out stuff. So I found, found um, that's what happened to me. And I think it's very important, as you said, to have been working in environments. And I was lucky in that the people I was working for completely understood. And it wasn't, you know, that was the big fear I had that I would be judged and I'd be, 
uh, it would affect my future work. And if anything, it, it, it did the opposite. It was like, just take as much time as you need. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all been great. Um, so uh, I think it's scary. I think if anyone's in that position, I can appreciate how terrifying it is because it is, it's seemingly there's no way out. Um, but there is, you know, and um, uh, I think it's important to always remind yourself that um, you have the right to, uh, to say no and, and to stop and to reevaluate and, and decompress and, uh, and um, filter, filter all of it through because there's no point otherwise. You know, you, you are, a, you know, your body is a temple. You know, your mind is um, an instrument it's a piece of equipment and you need to you know, make sure the software is up to date and there's no bugs in it and, uh, and it's all working well. And ultimately, ultimately, you know, I think all of us are in this business because it links back to that first thing we were talking about, which is, I guess, um, magic and joy. You know, we're into, we're into this to, I think not necessarily to make a lot of money, but we're in it to kind of, you know, live a purposeful life. And, um, and uh, to me, I mean, I find art and movies and music and books and painting and all of that stuff, certainly watching them and, you know, enjoying them gives me purpose and making them gives me purpose. So that's the most important thing. Um, and especially now in these days when it's, we're living in a very, very volatile, very unpredictable, very um, un, unknown industry, the more we, I think, um, centre ourselves and and uh, and prioritise what's important, the more I, the more I, more able we will be able, to, uh, the more able we will be to survive it, um, and to to uh, you know enjoy it because it's, I think it's something you've got to learn to enjoy, and that's the great thing about getting older as well and getting more experience is that I think you can kind of take your experience and even bad ones like the one I had and use that as a kind of like a, a, a positive thing, like going, well, I've learned that. Now I don't have to learn that again. I can move on and learn something else. Thanks, mate. That was a really good way of putting it. I'm just going to one last question and, and we could have ended there quite in quite a lovely way, but I just want to put this to you because um, I think it's relevant. So, um, uh, one of the most confronting things about Danger Close is watching um, 18 year old conscripts getting sent to a place that they don't know to fight a war that they really don't know too much about, um, potentially to lose their lives, get a bullet in the head, um, or if they manage to come back alive, maybe really still not be in one piece um, one way or another. You and I both have sons um, who would be of conscription age right now almost um, yeah 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 well you almost and me yes and um um and yet on the other side of the world we're watching in fact 18 year olds being sent into battle at the behest of well you know i won't get into the weeds here but you know i'm sure we feel the same about it um uh, potentially to lose their lives um um and that court certainly gives uh, someone uh, a parent pause and, and to be grateful that we live in a place where that's not going on right now. Um, but there's still a lot of unknowns for the future and it still makes you worry. How do you, what do you think, if any, the role is of creatives, be that musicians, writers, directors, in times of conflict, um, uh, is there anything that, that we should be doing or can do to make a situation better? I think it's. I think. Um, I think it's what we do by default. I think it's what the whole point of what we do is what we do. You know, I don't think there's any anything we should be doing more or less of. I think it's just this. I think that's what we're here for. It's to sort of be, um, again, as I said, sort of like a um, earlier, like the way music is a kind of a, a can heal and can be there as used as a as a as as a as a tool or as a as a function of kind of coping with the world, you know, I think art, music, whatever it is, films, uh, you know, as I said, they're food, you know, you've got to, to be, to be, I think, a healthy person, you've got, also, you've got to keep your mind active and, 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 and keep those, whatever it is that those receptors that, that uh, 
keep your brain alive. You've got to keep them firing. And I think anything, any subject, any film that you make about anything is going to provoke, it's going to lean towards some kind of meaning and going to kind of relate to some current issue, you know. And obviously current issues do affect the art you make or the material you, you make. So there's a sort of this feedback loop that you're always living inside of and that you're always being informed. And I think that's just the nature of, I'm going to use the word art. I'll put that a big umbrella uh, and there's a, that's a big umbrella. So what we do is actually by its very instinctive, intuitive nature, a response to what's going on around us, even, even indirectly, you know, you might write a piece of music because you read something in the paper that today about the Ukraine, but it's not, a, it's not about the Ukraine, but there's, it's, it's an emotional gut response to something that's going on inside your mind. So I think that's what we're here for is to sort of make some kind of meaning out of the madness, and give some kind of purpose, as I said before, you know, to the, to the chaos and to not let, I think it's very easy to read the news and to, to kind of be overwhelmed by it. And it's really important to sometimes um, just realise that there is other, there are great things in the world. You know, there is hope that there is um, a future, that there is, um, that humans, I think, you know, the good of men, you know what I mean? The men and women, or the good of people, you know, that there is good in us. Um, and to, and I think that's what art reminds us of is that, you know, we're all part of a collective humanity and that we, you know, we need to kind of, yeah, just keep doing what we do because otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it's not good. You know, we've got to kind of create light. I think it's really ultimately the response to that question and in any kind of creative endeavor is creating some form of light. What a beautiful way to end. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. I really appreciate your time, mate. Thanks, and, uh, Eddie. All, it was all the fun. Best for the next week. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Okay, man. Take care. Okay. Cheers. Huh.